Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a glass of white wine. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a mimosa, and today we're celebrating something special. This is our 100th full-length episode, so we asked our listeners what they wanted to hear us cover for this special occasion, and you chose the murder of Kathleen Peterson, which was chronicled in the docuseries The Staircase and was recently made into a dramatized miniseries for HBO. The Staircase is one of my favorite true crime docuseries documentaries, so I'm really excited to delve into this pretty complicated case. Keep in mind there are a lot of names, details, and dates, so be prepared and follow along as best you can. Kathleen Peterson was born on February 21st, 1953 in Greensboro, North Carolina. She grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and had two sisters and one brother, Candace, Lori, and Stephen. Kathleen was the first woman to be accepted to the prestigious Duke University School of Engineering. She went on to hold executive positions at IT companies and pharmaceutical companies, including Nortel. In 1977, she married her first husband, Fred Atwater, and the couple had one daughter named Caitlin. Kathleen and Fred split, and around 1986, she met Michael Peterson. Michael Peterson was born on October 23, 1943, in Nashville, Tennessee. He graduated from Duke University with a degree in political science. There, he served as president of the Sigma Nu fraternity and editor of the Chronicle Campus newspaper. Following his graduation, he began a job with the U.S. Department of Defense and married Patricia Sue. In 1968, Michael joined the Marine Corps and served in the Vietnam War. In 1971, he was given an honorable discharge after a car accident left him with a permanent disability. Michael and Patricia had two sons, Clayton and Todd. Michael worked as a government consultant, and the family moved to Germany, where they lived on a military base and befriended George and Elizabeth Ratliff. The Ratliffs had two young daughters, Margaret and Martha. George sadly died during a military mission, and then in 1985, Elizabeth died. German and U.S. authorities both investigated and concluded that Elizabeth died from a brain hemorrhage before falling down the stairs. Her nanny found Elizabeth at the bottom of her staircase, and there had been debate over the amount of blood at the scene. Michael had been the last one to see her alive after walking her home from dinner with him and his wife. Michael was not considered a suspect. Patricia and Michael divorced in the late 1980s. Clayton and Todd stayed with Patricia while Margaret and Martha moved with Michael to Durham, North Carolina. Todd and Clayton later moved in with their father as well. Michael was a writer who wrote three novels inspired by his time in Vietnam and co-authored two other novels. At one point, Michael wrote for the Durham Herald Sun newspaper where he often criticized the local police and a Durham County District Attorney, James Harden Jr. Michael ran for mayor of Durham in 1999, but his campaign was derailed in part when he was forced to admit that the Purple Heart he received resulted from the aforementioned car accident in Japan and not combat in Vietnam, as he sometimes claimed. Michael and Kathleen married in 1997 after they had been living together for several years. Their blended family got along well. Margaret and Martha were friends with Caitlin and actually introduced Michael to Kathleen. According to friends and family, Kathleen and Michael had a, quote, blissfully happy marriage, end quote, were, quote, unquote, totally compatible with one another and had many common interests, including travel and art. Around 2.40 a.m. on December 9, 2001, Michael frantically called 911 after finding Kathleen unconscious at the bottom of their house's staircase. He told the 911 operator that she had fallen down the steps, possibly quote-unquote 15 to 20 stairs, and that she was still breathing. When authorities arrived, the scene was more gruesome than they had imagined. Kathleen was lying in a pool of blood, and there was blood on the stairs and surrounding walls. She was, quote, splayed out on the floor, her head resting on the landing of the back staircase, end quote. Kathleen was declared dead at the scene. She was just 48 years old. Michael told authorities that he and Kathleen were home alone 
and had watched a movie together that evening before moving outside to sit by their pool and drink wine. Kathleen went inside to go to bed while Michael remained outside. He later made his way back into the house and found Kathleen. He believed Kathleen had mixed alcohol with Valium, which caused her to fall down the stairs. A medical examiner who examined her body at the scene concurred that the death was probably an accident. At the time of her death, Kathleen's blood alcohol level was 0.07%, just under the legal limit, and she had taken between 5 and 15 milligrams of Valium. An autopsy revealed that Kathleen suffered seven deep lacerations to her scalp, a fracture to her superior cornu of the left thyroid cartilage, among other severe injuries, and she had hair grasped in both of her hands. It was determined she had most likely been bludgeoned with a blunt object and that she had died from blood loss 90 minutes to two hours after sustaining her injuries. That was supported by the fact that the blood on Kathleen's head was dried when EMTs arrived, contradicting Michael's claims that he had found her no more than half an hour after the accident allegedly occurred. Police noted seeing a bottle of wine in two glasses on the kitchen counter that appeared to have been neatly placed there. Kathleen's fingerprints weren't on either glass, and Michael soon became the authorities' prime suspect. On December 20th, Michael was indicted for Kathleen's murder and surrendered to police not long after. The case gained media attention because of who Michael was in the manner of Kathleen's death. In a public statement, Michael said, quote, Kathleen was my life. I can't stop crying. I would never have done anything to hurt her, end quote. All of his children, including Caitlin and Kathleen's family, stood by Michael. However, that would soon change as Caitlin and Kathleen's siblings questioned his innocence after hearing details from the autopsy. Caitlin cut off contact from her step-siblings and eventually sided with the prosecution. It was also reported that Caitlin worked with her biological father to ensure she had control of her mother's estate so Michael did not have access to the funds. Police seized Michael's computer and discovered that he had deleted 216 files the day before Kathleen's death and 352 files two days after. The deleted files were recovered along with deleted emails that detailed Michael's financial issues. In one email, Michael said that both of his sons were living in debt and struggling. In another, he asked a relative for $5,000 for one of his adopted daughter's college tuitions. In another, he asked his ex-wife to take out a $30,000 home equity loan to help their son's debt issues. On January 14, 2002, Michael posted bail and was left to await his trial at home. Less than a month after making bail, the Petersons allowed French filmmaker Jean-Xavier de Lestrade into their life to film a documentary series centered around the case. De Lestrade had previously directed the 2001 documentary Murder on a Sunday Morning, which centered on the Brenton Butler case, in which a 15-year-old African-American boy was wrongfully accused of murder. The movie won the Oscar for Best Documentary Feature in 2002. He tasked producer Allison Lushak with tracking down a criminal justice story in the U.S. that was going to trial, would make a good documentary, and was in a location where they could reliably put cameras. Lushak spent hours on the phone with Michael and Kathleen's family members, attorneys, the sheriff's office, and court administrators, building trust, negotiating access, and maintaining it for over a decade. Michael's attorney, David Rudolph, allowed the team to film on the condition that they couldn't air footage until the appeals were exhausted because he didn't know whether the docuseries would be helpful for Michael's case. The filmmakers edited the documentary under that agreement until Rudolph later decided to stop holding up the documentary and let the team air their footage. Later that year in October, Caitlin filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Michael, and she was awarded a $25 million judgment in the case in 2008. As prosecutors led by James Harden Jr., the same DA Michael was known to criticize, were working on the case, they learned of Elizabeth Ratliff's oddly similar death and German authorities reopened her case. In June 2003, Elizabeth's body was exhumed and driven across the country from Texas to North Carolina, where a new autopsy was performed. This new autopsy found that Elizabeth had died from blunt force trauma to the head, likely as a result of a homicidal attack. On July 1, 2003, Michael Peterson's trial began with Judge Orlando Hudson presiding. The prosecution argued that Michael murdered Kathleen with a long, thin, rounded object after she confronted him 
after finding 2,000 photos of naked men in an email exchange with a male sex worker on his computer. The murder weapon was assumed to be a missing blow poke from the family's house. Prosecutors pointed out how Michael lied about his military service and brought in former sex worker Brent Walgamont, who testified that Peterson paid him for sex on several occasions. They presented gay porn that Michael had viewed on the internet, that their marriage was not what it appeared. During the trial, Assistant District Attorney Frida Black said, quote, Kathleen would have been infuriated by learning that her husband, who she truly loved, was bisexual and having an extramarital relationship, not with another woman, but a man, which would have been humiliating and embarrassing to her. We believe that once she learned this information, that an argument ensued and a homicide occurred, end quote. Caitlin served as a witness for the prosecution and firmly believed her mother did not know about Michael's sexuality. They also shared details of Elizabeth Ratliff's death and accused Michael of staging the crime scene. One of the expert witnesses used by the prosecution, Dwayne Deaver, a blood splatter analyst, who came to the conclusion that there had been at least four blows to Kathleen's head to cause the splatter on the wall. In an experiment, Dwayne placed a bloody sponge in the staircase that represented Kathleen's head and showed the jury he was able to get blood on the inside of his shorts, like Michael's. Since there was no cast-off blood pattern, he proposed the weapon had been cleaned in between strikes. The prosecution also mentioned financial difficulties as a potential motive. The Petersons allegedly had over $140,000 in credit card debt and were spending $100,000 more than what they earned in a year. They also noted that Kathleen was worried about losing her job and that she had a $1.8 million life insurance policy, which Michael was the beneficiary. David and Michael's defense team brought in a slew of high-profile expert witnesses, including forensic pathologist Dr. Werner Spitz and forensic scientist Dr. Henry Lee, who had worked on the Jean Benet Ramsey case. The defense argued that the blood splatter was consistent with an accidental fall and that Kathleen died in a freak accident when she tripped walking up the staircase, fell backwards, and hit her head on the doorframe, causing the larger lacerations and a lot of blood to be drawn. She likely knocked herself out when she tried to stand up, but was dizzy and slipped on her blood and fell again, causing the other lacerations. She likely had a lot of blood on her face and her hair, and if she was coughing, it would have produced a bloodstain pattern on the wall. In addition, Rudolph focused on police and prosecutor error. As Rudolph said at the trial, quote, the police didn't tape off the area of the stairwell until 3.34 a.m., almost an hour after the call came in, and by then it was just too late. The blood in that area had been completely altered. The scene at the house had been completely contaminated, end quote. He even produced what he claimed was the quote-unquote missing blow poke, which he said had been found in the Peterson's garage and was not covered with blood. Since Kathleen had no skull fractures, no brain swelling, and no bruising of the brain, they did not think she was bludgeoned with the blow poke. In response to the details of Elizabeth's death and Michael's potential involvement, the defense claimed there was evidence to show that her body was still warm when she was found the following morning by her nanny. The defense also stated that Michael and Kathleen had an ideal marriage and that Michael was not a violent person. Throughout the trial, Michael was adamant that Kathleen knew he was bisexual and accepted his affairs. In response to the financial motive, Rudolph stated the couple had resources of around $1 million and a house worth $600,000 to $700,000, so money was not an issue. After four days of deliberation, a jury found Michael guilty of first-degree murder on October 10, 2003. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. De La Straw later interviewed the jury, who said they were greatly influenced by the amount of blood Kathleen lost and the lacerations to her head. Michael maintained his innocence even after his conviction. Following his trial, Kathleen's sisters claimed Michael was controlling of Kathleen and that Caitlin kept a diary that had details of her mom's troubled marriage. In 2004, De La Straw's documentary series was released to critical acclaim. In 2006, Michael filed for bankruptcy as his legal expenses depleted his finances. 
That same year, his attorneys filed an appeal based on judicial mistakes, but the Court of Appeals rejected it in September of 2006. He appealed once again to the North Carolina Supreme Court, but they upheld the Court of Appeals decision. A 2010 independent report found that Dwayne Deaver had given quote-unquote materially misleading and quote-unquote deliberately false testimony on the crime scene's blood splatter evidence and withheld information. Deaver overlooked the shirt Michael was wearing when EMTs arrived at his home. Deaver eventually admitted he did do a Luma light test on Michael's shirt and did not find blood splatter supporting the defense. This information was withheld from the defense team and came out during the trial. There was also problems with Deaver's blood splatter experiment. Videos of the experiment show that Deaver lifted his leg and pulled his shorts leg open before beating the sponge with an object that resembled a blow poke which essentially guaranteed blood would get in the shorts and match the evidence. The sponge was also moved to a location in the staircase that could be struck more easily with a blow poke than in the location D recalculated Kathleen's head was allegedly hit. Tim Palmback, a member of Michael's defense, testified that Deaver, quote, focused on only some of the blood droplets in the area and didn't disclose to jurors that there was other blood at the scene that didn't fit his findings, end quote. Finally, the instructions from the police department were to do a DNA test on Michael and Kathleen's clothes before blood stain analysis. Susie Baker, who worked with Deaver, changed the instructions to have the clothes sent straight to Deaver for blood stain analysis. The evidence was never tested for DNA and was not stored properly. In total, it was discovered that Deaver had misrepresented evidence in 34 different cases, and he additionally misrepresented his qualifications. In December 2011, Michael was released on $300,000 bail, was given an ankle monitor, and was placed under house arrest after a new trial was ordered by Judge Hudson. A new trial was scheduled for May 2017, despite Michael's request for the new trial to be dismissed. Rudolph gave his client three options, a no contest plea, an Alfred plea, or a new trial. Rudolph explained the Alfred plea to Peterson, saying that he'd be pleading guilty, but that he wouldn't be pleading guilty because he was guilty, but rather because he wanted to avoid another trial. At first, Michael did not want to move forward with the Alfred plea, but on February 24, 2017, Michael entered an Alfred plea to a reduced charge of voluntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to time already served and became a free man. Judge Hudson later said a second trial would have left a reasonable doubt not to convict. De La Strade returned to document Michael's release and plea and the conclusion of Michael's case in three follow-up episodes. Though Caitlin was awarded $25 million in the wrongful death suit, she will likely never see any of it because of Michael's bankruptcy. However, Caitlin's true goal with the lawsuit was to ensure Michael does not profit from this case in any way, shape, or form. From about 2004 to 2017, Michael dated Sophie Brunet, an editor on the Staircase docuseries. Brunet is adamant that their relationship did not affect her work. He's since released two books about the case and has donated the profits to charity. Michael is now 78 years old and still resides in North Carolina. The murder weapon in Kathleen's death has never been found, and no one has ever been charged with Elizabeth Ratliff's death. Michael continues to maintain his innocence while Kathleen's family is still firm in their belief that Michael killed Kathleen. Del, what are your thoughts on this case? I think that one of the things that adds to how complex it is is the number of moving parts and the number of people that seemingly have something to say about this case and want to make sure that their viewpoint is the viewpoint that the wider public is actually listening to and believes. For me, I personally do believe that Michael killed Kathleen, and I think that he used details from Elizabeth's death to try to cover his track. I find it very hard to believe the defense's story of for whatever reason, Kathleen just kept getting up and kept falling. And that's why she kept having a different laceration. 
it just doesn't make sense to me. There's plenty of reasons why she wouldn't have any deep brain bruising as a result of getting hit, especially if she was unconscious pretty fast. It could have been a rattling of the brain, which wouldn't necessarily show up on any exams. So I do think that the defense was pretty faulty in trying to claim that there wasn't enough damage to the brain to support blunt force trauma. I definitely agree with them that Fever definitely did a horrifying job. And the fact that he allowed whatever ego and whatever was driving him to lie in 34 separate cases, including this one, about the evidence and what he was actually able to find is definitely disgusting. And the fact that it also causes people not to trust technicians like blood splatter analysts because it's like, well, if this is just subjective, then you guys could just make something up to support whatever the prosecution wants you guys to support. So I definitely think that Michael didn't get a fair trial. And I do think it was good that there was going to be a retrial to make sure that only the true evidence was being presented. And for him, it made sense for him to take the Alford plea and just, you know, time serve, get out. And good on Caitlin for sticking to her guns and making sure that he wasn't able to profit or in any way benefit from Kathleen's death. I definitely think that that took a really strong person to do that. And I think that it was probably really hard on her, but she still pushed through. And so I think that was really good that she did that, especially if the laws weren't going to automatically make sure that he didn't profit off this. Uh, What are your thoughts on it? My thoughts are pretty similar to yours. Like I said, I really enjoy talking about this case and learning more about it. I think people are really drawn into it because it has so many elements and so many twists and turns. It's got the money. It's got sex. It's got someone dying under mysterious circumstances. It's really everything that makes a case interesting. Like you, I do think Michael is guilty. I do think it's hard to believe the defense's story. And I definitely recommend looking at some crime scene photos because I don't know how that blood got there from just a fall down the stairs. But I also find it hard to believe what the prosecution came up with too. Their theory of the case and what happened to me is very speculative and there's really no concrete evidence to back up their claims of what happened the night of Kathleen's death. And I think Michael's sexuality was very much sensationalized by the prosecution. I think they took advantage of people's potential prejudice, too. We don't know if Kathleen knew about Michael's sexuality or if they did somehow have an open relationship. So I don't think it's really fair to speculate. And Michael has kind of gone back and forth about whether Kathleen knew or not. The kids seem to have known. So I'm not sure if Kathleen did know. I don't think... She mentioned it to any of her friends or family, which I can understand, especially in 2000, 2001, when this case took place. That, you know, that's a pretty taboo subject and you might not want to bring that up to your friends and family for fear of judgment, no matter how close you are to them. I did want to mention some quotes that Kevin McMonagle, a crime law professor at Case Western University School of Law, said he's also a former federal prosecutor and he told A&E True Crime that introducing Petersons bisexuality was, quote, pretty relevant in terms of how happy their marriage was and whether or not they were arguing, but it was also very prejudicial. You could imagine, especially back then, there could be some jurors who would condemn him for that and maybe decide the case on an emotional basis. End quote. So because of that, and because of uh, Dwayne Deaver's unethical and poor, poor work, I don't think Michael got a fair trial either. It definitely is hard to know who to trust when it comes to the expert analysis, because you have two quote unquote experts telling you two different things. And, you know, if they have these credentials, I wouldn't necessarily know what to believe. And in this case, Dwayne Deaver did not examine the case to the fullest extent. And we can't ignore that. This is not the only case that Dwayne Deaver gave unethical examination to and gave false testimony to. 
I did want to mention this. I'm not sure where these videos came from, but Todd, Michael's son, has released some videos, I believe, on his social media pages where he's really opening up about his relationship with his dad and his feelings about his dad at the moment. I will say Todd seems very erratic in these videos, so maybe we can't believe them to the fullest extent, but they're worth a watch. Um, you can find them on YouTube, but... In these, Todd has said that his dad cheated on his mom, Patricia, with Kathleen and that Patricia and Michael constantly fought, but that he never saw Kathleen or Michael fight and they somehow had the world's greatest relationship. Um, at the time of the recording, he also says that he's not on good terms with his dad. And in one of the videos, he said that he realized his dad is a serial killer and that he killed for money. And I think this is more in relation to his mother Patricia's death. So from what I understand, Patricia died in 2021 from a heart attack. And Todd said that Michael was present when she died and that he waited three hours to call 911 and that he thinks he did it because of insurance money that Michael would get. I haven't heard anything else about that, uh, but that's pretty despicable if that is the case. Um, he calls his dad a sociopath. He also said that his dad put hits out on people while he was in prison and that Todd helped his dad do that. Again, don't have details on that, but if that's true, that's an even crazier element to Michael Peterson's life and criminal history. This really stood out to me. Todd also said that his dad has tried to ruin his sobriety. So again, that would explain why they don't have the best relationship at the moment. And I'm not sure how the other children feel. I'm not sure how the other children feel, but I did want to include this because it is the most recent update, I guess you could say, to the case. Del, I also wanted to ask you, do you think Kathleen gets lost in this case? I think that Kathleen is treated like most murder victims are treated, where the more interesting part of the story is always on the person that's still alive and the details of how the murder victim died versus the actual murder victim and any information about them. What are your thoughts? I have to say it was very hard to find information about Kathleen, her personality, her upbringing, which for such a high profile case is strange to me. And I think it really does go to show how much she does get lost in the staircase story. The makers of the staircase have gotten some pushback from critics who say that this true crime documentary series didn't show enough Kathleen Peterson while covering Michael's trial for her murder. And that's a common criticism of the true crime community in general, that it focuses too much on the crime and the killer rather than the victim. And in response to that, director Jean-Xavier de Lestrade stood by his decision to focus on the trial, saying that the series is about the American judicial system and not, in fact, Kathleen Peterson. Which I understand, and I don't think there's anything wrong with focusing on the American judicial system, but it is very troublesome how Kathleen is not there. And it's weird because she is at the center of this case. It's all about her murder, but we don't know much about her. They focus so much on Michael in the staircase that you definitely feel sympathy for him. You get to know him and his family, his legal team. I know I definitely had some sympathy, empathy, whatnot for Michael. I do still think Michael is guilty and some information was definitely left out of the staircase series. And it's information that, to me, hurts Michael's defense, which I absolutely do not approve of that being left out. And I was really pissed off when I heard about that because it really made me change some opinions I had of the case. So it really goes to show that if you enjoy something that you saw in a true crime docuseries or podcast or dramatization, look into some things for yourself because not every detail and aspect can be included Included, and some things do get sensationalized. And I wanted to include this quote from Kathleen's sister, Candace. She's been really vocal about her thoughts, and she told the BBC radio podcast, quote, many times during the trial, something would happen, and I would want to tell Kathleen. And then, oh, that's right, she's dead. 
oh, that's right, it's you, Kathleen, whose murder we're talking about. It was like a constantly cold bucket of water in my face. I still have a hard time. My sister is the story here. She is the murder victim, end quote. One controversial theory that came out after Michael's trial is that of the owl theory. In 2008, Michael's friend, attorney Larry Pollard, held a press conference and shared the owl theory with the public. The theory centers on the idea that Kathleen was potentially attacked and killed by a wild owl. The theory came to him after he saw pictures of Kathleen's head wounds and consulted with an ornithologist. According to the National Audubon Society, a barred owl, a common species in Durham, got entangled in Kathleen's hair, causing serious injuries like the removal of part of her scalp and caused her to fall to her death down the stairs. Pollard and the Audubon Society made note of microscopic owl feathers that were found in Kathleen's hair and pine needles stuck to her hand. They also stated that the owl's talons could have caused the lacerations to Kathleen's scalp as they did mirror the marks of an owl's talon. This theory is backed by at least three experts in the field, and all three have written that Kathleen's injuries were consistent with injuries from an owl's talons rather than from blunt force trauma. Pollard called this, quote, new and compelling evidence and probably the single most important piece of evidence found so far in this case because it connects the attack by a bird with the victim and it is held in the victim's hand, end quote. Sophie Brunet believes in this theory, although it was never mentioned in the documentary because it was considered too unbelievable. No shit. Attorney David Rudolph admitted that over time, he has come to realize that the owl theory is quote unquote, more believable than he first thought and says Michael has come around to that theory too. What helped convince Rudolph is that there are hundreds to thousands of documented owl attacks that involve a victim being attacked on their head. Michael's defense attorney said, quote, when you look at her injuries, they do appear consistent with being made by an owl's talons, but I would hate to risk my client's life on future or future on that argument, end quote. Del, what are your thoughts on the owl theory? So I feel like the owl theory is very similar to the alien theory that comes up with a lot of missing persons cases, where it's fascinating, you want to hear all about it, but like the defense attorney said, it's not something that you're actually going to go to court with. So I find this really hard to believe, especially since like the noise that would have been made with a sustained owl attack. I just don't see how that would have happened without Michael, who was outside, hearing an owl attacking his wife. Like, that just doesn't make sense to me. Also, when we were talking about the blood evidence, it seemed like the way the blood splatter was, was in different parts. And those parts were even hard to reach with the blow poke. So I don't see how those lacerations would have been caused by an owl if a blow poke couldn't do it and have it turn up in that particular spot on the staircase. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So while I do think it's a fascinating theory and I think it's really interesting, I don't think that it's a plausible theory in this case. What are your thoughts? You're so right about this being so fascinating of a theory and an odd theory too that you just want to hear more. But I agree. I'm not going to say it's not plausible, but I don't believe it. It's interesting, but I don't think there's enough to really support it. There's a lot of holes. I would think that there would be more feathers in the house and on Kathleen, maybe owl droppings as well. And How did the owl really get in and out of the house either? I mean, maybe there was like a window or a door. It doesn't make a ton of sense to me, but I had to throw it in because people are pretty divided on this theory and it's just another strange detail about the case. As we mentioned, Michael Peterson entered an Alford plea before his second trial was set to start. According to Cornell Law, an Alford plea registers a formal admission of guilt towards charges in criminal court, while the defendant simultaneously expresses their innocence toward those same charges. It's similar to no contest and the acceptance of guilt, but the no contest plea is for a person that will accept punishment even if he or she does not admit guilt. 
and Alfred Plea skips the full process of a criminal trial because the defendant agrees to accept all the ramifications of a guilty verdict. Many defendants may use an Alfred Plea because the evidence is too strong for a trial to make any difference in the avoidance of a conviction. The legal professional may explain that the irrefutable evidence will sway the judge or jury to the prosecution's argument and still lead to a conviction for the crime even if the defendant is innocent. Taking the chance of a trial could end with tougher penalties than when pleading guilty through the Alford plea. The Alford plea comes from the 1970 case of North Carolina versus Alford. In that case, the defendant was indicted for first-degree murder and faced the death penalty. There was a lot of strong evidence against Alford and his criminal defense attorney recommended a guilty plea. The prosecutor agreed to a guilty plea for second-degree murder, which carried a penalty of two to 30 years in prison. Alfred pleaded guilty, but said he was not guilty. Instead, he said he was admitting guilt to avoid the death penalty. The Supreme Court held that the court could accept a guilty plea based on involuntary and intelligent choice, even if the defendant continues to claim innocence. The judge imposed the maximum sentence and placed Alfred in prison for 30 years. It is also called the best interest plea. Alfred pleas are not allowed in some states, including New Jersey and Indiana. Alfred pleas are rare, but have been used in several other high-profile cases, including the West Memphis Three, Lee Boyd Malvo, who took part in the Beltway or D.C. sniper attacks, and actor Vince Vaughn after a fight at a bar in North Carolina. Before we go, we wanted to thank everyone for helping us get to 100 episodes. Your listening, support, and love means a lot to us. So that wraps up this week's case. Again, thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the murder of Kathleen Peterson and whether or not you think Michael Peterson is guilty. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. As always, stay safe.